All right, everyone. So uh, welcome again to our guest speaker series. Uh, as you know, uh, we've had a number of great guests over the, the, the term or terms at this point. Um, some of the guests that I'm most proud of uh, and a little biased about are our alumni members. Uh, in particular, I'm, I'm very grateful to have Daniel Nascimento uh, joining us from our C9 group. Um, mm -hmm. Daniel had a very interesting journey, journey both within the MDM program and post MDM. And he's got a really cool venture um, that he's working on now. He also, you know, he spent his time with us in Vancouver, but he now is enjoying life on the East Coast out in Halifax, uh, running his company Bit and Toast Games. Um, he's gonna, he's got a great presentation prepared for us tonight. Um, but what, what I wanna do before we really get a, um, kick things off is do a quick land acknowledgement. So this building behind me, uh, we know it's situated in Vancouver and we do like to acknowledge uh, the Coast Salish peoples on whose traditional territories we create, collaborate and transform ourselves. So we're super grateful um, for all kind of connections that we can make and staying aware, especially if, if with our First Nations of ways that we can integrate and work together in the future. Um, Anyway, tonight again, it's about uh, learning from our alumni. Um, this is kind of a, a bit of a show and tell from Daniel and hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. I had a sneak peek at uh, some of his uh, um, presentation material. Um, so uh, I am looking forward to, to seeing that. But before we get to, to you, Daniel, I'm gonna do a quick um, slide share because I grabbed some, some Zoom backgrounds behind me because you have been a guest speaker in the past. I'm gonna give you the shout out for that. That's uh, that's this guy right there. So that's Daniel giving back in that way. Um, I also wanted to pull up a few other things that, uh, oh yeah, this little team right here. So that's, uh, let's, let's, let's play the where's Daniel game. There we go. So he's had, uh, I'm thinking of his classmates and seeing everyone that's around there. And I was reminiscing because I was looking at some other really cool projects, I believe. What was this thing over there? I was at EA and this was at the film festival. You remember that little spaceship thing? Yeah, it was Duralde's mission, a VR oh, game. Duralde, it's pretty cool. Yeah. That was, that was a cool project. No one's social distancing. <laughs> no one's, well, that's so weird, right? To go back, this is, who, who's, who's yeah, doing this nowadays, right? So it's a- No, we're in the masks. Exactly, it's a very, very strange to see it. But again, like some of the, your, your classmates, so, um, you know, some of the project teammates are now at EA. So it's just, we have alum sort of all over the, all over the place. And uh, I mean, you, you are, I think my, my first alumni member that I can think of in Halifax, Nova Scotia, um, but yeah, with that, why don't you pull up your uh, um, your slides and share a little bit of what, what you brought with us today, and then we'll go to Q&A later on. So thanks again, Daniel, for joining us, and I'll be right along for the ride. So. Share screen. Okay. All right. So I'm uh, Daniel Asimento, but in the internet, I usually go by Daniel SD, and my company is Bit and Toast Games. And at first, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came to be involved in game development. Uh, coming out of high school, I was torn on what to do. I was like 18, and uh, I really liked computers, but I didn't know which way I wanted to go, like computer programming with computer science, or more of the art side with, I uh, used to like uh, Photoshop at the time. And I ended up deciding on advertisements, which I thought was... Uh, I didn't know if I would like programming because I never programmed before at that point. And the artistic side, I was already more familiar with. And I thought advertisement was kind of like encompassing everything in a, instead of just going into design and just being able to do art. Uh, I ended up not liking advertisement and I got my bachelor's, finished my diploma, and I decided to study animation, which was something I, I really wanted to learn for the animation for the art. But at the time, there was not uh, as much uh, online tutorials on YouTube. Like, it was really hard to find this knowledge. So I ended up deciding to study in Vancouver, the Vancouver Film School for 3D animation. And coming out of that program, I had trouble finding a job at the time. Like, uh, there wasn't a lot of jobs in animation going on. It was 2008. There was the whole, like, uh, problem that happened around the time. Uh, and I was doing a lot of modding in uh, Dungeon Defenders. I was taking the characters out of the game, making like funny poses and posting random over forums. And I got my first job in the industry because of that. Just playing around with this, I ended up getting a call from the developers of the game. And they're like, oh, we saw what you're doing uh, with our game in the forums. Or like, we're from Frenchy Entertainment. And I was so confused. Like, how did you guys get my number? Because I put my portfolio in the signature of the, the forums and they found my resume there. 
So I got a, a job doing animation uh, for the trailer of Dungeon Defender 2, which was so cool for me because I love that game. And that kind of got me into the ideas like, oh, I could actually work with games. I always liked playing video games, but I didn't even think that that could be a, something I could work with. I tried fighting some programmers online to like maybe use my art to make games, but I had a lot of trouble finding reliable programmers. A lot of them would start making a game together and then they would kind of vanish and like, I just made all this art and now I have nothing to show for it. So I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna learn how to program. And I found this book on Unreal Development Kit, which was Unreal 3. And now it's a language that doesn't even exist anymore because Unreal 4 uses C++ and Blueprints instead. But that got me started into like, oh, I can actually learn how to program. I can actually get this. I'm not just an artist now. I kind of know how to make a game. And I made a lot of games. I started with Elementale, that's the first one you guys saw over there, with a very big scope that I totally could not finish on my own. And once I learned that, it's like, okay, I can't make a game that big, but I can make smaller games. And then I just kept making a lot of small games. And each game taught me a lot more, and I, I was getting better and better. Uh, I made about 30 or so game jam games, small games, all just for free, released online, like no intention of making money, just learning. Uh, until uh, I ended up coming to the Masters of Digital Media program, the CDM. And uh, this program was very exciting for me because it was very hands-on. It was like term one, term two project, like you're actually not just learning theory, but you're actually putting it into practice by uh, being with a group of other people working on the same project, which was so, so interesting to me. Uh, and from that, I finally started working on a commercial project, which was Rocket Fist. That was my first commercial project. That's what I'm saying, sell me out over there. Uh, Rocket Fist started as a term two project at the CDM. We were working with uh, uh, partners with uh, Sony Entertainment. And they wanted us to make uh, little games for the PS Vita using the most underutilized features of the PS Vita, which uh, the PS Vita was like one of the first uh, consoles of uh, portable consoles that had a back panel and that had a dual analog sticks at the time. And Rocket Fist was one of the projects. We, we submitted seven prototypes to, to them. It wasn't even called Rocket Fist at the time. All of the prototypes were like very tiny gray box games. And this one really resonated with me because we play tested a lot and really enjoyed playing this game uh, with my, like our classmates. Uh, and it wasn't uh, selected by the clients because it wasn't really what he was looking for. He was looking for something that used more of the other features of the PS Vita while uh, Rocket Fist only used the dual joysticks. Uh, I decided to keep working on it because I liked the game so much and it kind of became my pet project that I would work on when I went home at night or like at the weekends. I always really liked making games as you guys can could see before uh, joining the CDM or before making money with this. I, was, I made 33 games just because I really enjoyed doing it. And it's something that even if it didn't work out for me commercially, it would still be my hobby. And Rocket Fist came to be a really cool game. Uh, we got, I got to release it one and a half years later after finishing this game. It took me a long time. Uh, and I'll talk more about why later on. This is the release trailer. So I'm, I'm going to jump in here, too, to give you a bit of a breather mm -hmm. and to kind of give you some props here, too, and to speak to this project. So. Yeah. Um, again, the, the connection to Sony Japan, um, they were really interested in exploring just concepts of the use of the PS uh, Vita. So it wasn't a commercial project. You were generating ideas. Yeah, of course not. So, so you were able to t you know, take your IP and do something with it. So it's just one of those, yeah. you know, it's one, you know, it's not like you took a client's idea and did something with it. You actually had your own and did something yeah. with it. So it's a, a nice, um, but also what I really liked about it is that you know, this was um, pre kind of switch in that too. So I mean, you got inspired mm -hmm. having worked on a project that was initiated by solving a problem for a client or researching yeah. how this device could, um, you know, be utilized in different ways. And to see Rocket Fist, you know, evolve from the idea to your Steam release and then ultimately switch, um, 
it's it was, it's in, interesting to see that that success and kind of how that translated because you're again one of the points i like to make on this call too is that you're one of our entrepreneurial um alumni members who went through the the mdm journey but you weren't you didn't do a pitch project or a venture internship but you still found your way as an entrepreneur so i, I like the students to know that because not everyone's path is going to be the same right we have some that do pitch projects or you know mm -hmm. accept that route, but it doesn't exclude anyone that opportunity to to potentially become an entrepreneur down yeah. on the road. And your journey is you know definitely inspiring. So anyway, I'll let you wanted to give you a breather, but also to kind of see like I'm I like how you noted that this is the game you're most proud of. And I'm, but one of the things that I'm really proud of is that it, it actually came out of your time with us, right? So I'm yeah. just like yeah. Anyway, thanks Daniel. It's back to you. Oh thank you very much. Yeah, Rocket Fist is a game that to this day I still go back and play it myself. Like a lot of my games are like, it was something I was testing at the time. I don't actually play it. Rocket Fist is one that I like enough that I, I keep playing. And Rocket Fist was a success not only with me, not only with my classmates that we played a lot with the CDM. A lot of people playing and excited. It's a game that plays very well with like lots of people together, which we can't do right now in COVID, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a good way of playing. Uh, but it did not sell well at the time. Like when I came out of the PC, it wasn't a good fit for the PC because it kind of needs that connection, like people playing together. Uh, what the box was my game that came next. I was kind of like uh, disappointed with the sales of the Fist. It took me one year and a half to finish, and I was like, that's not worth uh, commercially to, to spend one year and a half making that. And What the Box was a game that came out at Game Jam. And Game Jams are, were very important to me, like those first three games that I made before. Most of them came out of Game Jams, like very short time frames, like one week, three days. And this one was seven days uh, from August 13 to August 21. And the theme was, this shouldn't be here. And the idea there was, uh, making a game in which everyone are boxes, as you can see, like what a box, and the environment is full of boxes. So if you stay still and you just wait and you see a box moving, like the other player doesn't know if you're part of the environment or if you're actually a player. So you can kind of play hide and seek that way. And I started very simple, great boxing, uh, just testing ideas. I was live streaming a lot of the time, so I could I always find people to play test because when you're live streaming, you usually have viewers like, oh, just download this, this zip file, let's, let's play test live. And people are having a lot of fun play testing, which is kind of similar to like, the play testing uh, of Rocket Fist at the CDM, which people are having a lot of fun together. Uh, but what the box had a very, very short deadline. I had seven days to make the game. Uh, and then of the seventh day, I published it for free. I put it on Game Jolt, put it on HIO. And people actually started, like, some people here and there giving me money for it. Like, uh, people were donating because, like, it was name your price. You could download it for $0 or you could send me some money. And people are actually doing that. And what the box ended up becoming a success in uh, public downloads, like, a lot of people downloaded, and also in sales, even though it was free. Like I ended up making in one week $600 out of the box, which was a free project. So I was like, okay, maybe this game uh, has potential to become something commercial better than Rocket Fist. So I decided to take it to Steam, but not how I took Rocket Fist. I did not want to take one year and a half working in a project just to see it fail. Uh, we got to stream green, green lights really quickly. We got covered by uh, Jim Sterling, which was a big YouTuber, and he's still a big YouTuber, but he got like 66,000 views. Like he was like praising the game, which he doesn't usually do or didn't do at the time. He used like take down games, like, oh, this game is using assets, this game is doing this. But he praised about the box, which was very encouraging. And I decided to not let myself work for more than one month in this game. I was like, one month, that's it. I'll publish it and we'll see what happens. I'm not spending another year and a half working in the same project. And I got to, to the store in 29 days. From the day of the brainstorm of the initial idea of the product to the commercial release on Steam, 29 days. And the game ended up being a success this time. This is the release trailer.
if Dennis wants to add something, you can also. <laughs> No, I, again, which is, a, it's a really um, amazing story in that too, like that you learn from that first project with the long development cycle, lots of fun, lots of testing, and then you decided mm -hmm. to condense this into this one month kind of build, build time. And then the YouTube sort of exposure. But I think, I mean, what, one, you, you noted that the exposure didn't necessarily translate to sales, right? Was that... Um, because I, I I had I think I went into it with a myth that idea that oh million like a you know sixty six thousand yeah. views is going to translate to you know even a you know one percent turnaround on sales or is you know going to significant yeah and then when it's you know talk about millions of views PewDiePie I don't know if you've got that in this presentation or not but I, I didn't get that into this presentation but yeah PewDiePie oh. played the game it got millions of views uh, but it doesn't directly translate to sales. I guess like it indirectly increases the, the the presence of the game, more people talking about the game, but you can't see a correlation between sales. Like, oh, that day the game released, that day, like those two days you had million views. You don't see a jump in the chart of sales. We see like a kind of, the chart's more of a constant. Like it goes down, sometimes it goes up, but it's, there's, there, was, there wasn't a jump correlated to that video, which is interesting. Now I'm going to ask you one other question. So when did you make the jump from being employee to being full-time, you know, developer entrepreneur? Because you were working at Archiac when you first left yeah. for a short stint. And then I remember you said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do my thing. Like what, what, uh, what allowed for that? What, how did you uh, make that move? I kind of had to wait for a period of time for my, uh, my, uh, Postgrad work. Yeah, post graduation uh, PGMP, the the provincial nomination to right, get my PNC. my okay. PR and everything. So that time, like I, I worked for an architect for a little bit, but for a little bit, like I had to stop because I couldn't be working anymore. So I had to wait some time. And in that time, I was just making games, playing around, doing game jams. And yeah, about November was when I could finally work again, and I was like. I'm just going to try to do this on my own. I'm just going to try to do my own thing. And it thankfully worked with other box. Otherwise I would have probably have had to get a job and like just do it on my free time. Like I was doing with rocket fist at, at first. Well, it had phenomenal numbers too. In that one month of sales, even I remember like it, it had a really. It did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what a box it ended up being like the front page of steam, like a, uh, on the popular new releases, it was like on the top of the Steam Spy charts at the time. It even got to the front page of uh, Twitch with like thousands of viewers near Overwatch and Rocket League and all the big games, which was really exciting for me. Uh, PewDiePie made a video together with Markiplier, Jacksepticeye. They were all in the same game together. And they each released their own version of the video so you could see like them playing together through each one's eyes which was really cool. And each video had millions of views. You can see over here, Peter Pie at the time, like had a three dot four million views of that video. So yeah, it was really cool. And that's what prompted me to finally start my company. I was like, okay, there's a lot of money coming in. I need to figure out a way to, to manage this money. I need to start a company. So I'm not like getting hit with all those uh, personal taxes. <laughs> so kind of started my own company with that. Did you incorporate like in BC then? Like this, I'm just going to, I'm going to try to yes. follow your journey to Halifax here because I'm curious. But I, I incorporated like, in BC then. I, I stayed in BC for a while too. Like uh, I only came to Halifax this year. Well, last year, I mean, 2020. And the housing cost in Halifax is a lot lower than Vancouver, right? That's it is, yes. Uh, the houses here, the prices are great, which is kind of what brought us here. We were looking mm -hmm. at the price of houses. We we're thinking of buying, and like in Vancouver, you can't find anything for for cheap. Over here, we we'll find you really good houses for 150, 200, 300. Hey, did you say 150? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was like, I that's, that's, wow. Okay. That's, I, yeah. All right. I ended up buying my house for around 350, which is yeah. great. And it was like a that's less than uh, a one bedroom condo in Vancouver. That's, yeah, yeah. This is four bedroom. It has a garage. It's, it's great. Yeah. Well, congrats. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, and it's, a, it's a beautiful part of the country. So it's, yeah, uh, I'm really, really enjoying Halifax. I find people here are really nice too. And like uh, lots of great things to see. There's Cape Breton, there's a uh, Pegasus Cove, lots of good things. And the, the, the temperature is not that different from Vancouver. Like the, the lowest I've seen was minus 14 in this winter. Yeah. 
yeah, that's kind of what brought me here. Yeah, yeah. no, that's amazing. That's, uh, I mean, again, it's a, it's, um, I haven't visited yet, but I've, I've seen pictures and I've heard, I mean, it's a very beautiful place. There's universities, there's like all the yeah. major city with it on the Halifax side. So that's, that's really cool. Anyway, you can keep going. I didn't want to stall you there. No, no problem. Uh, that's yeah. another good thing about being an entrepreneur, uh, working for yourself. Like there's no, nothing locking you down. Like you can work anywhere, like wherever you want. Like we spent, uh, me and my partner, we spent a year traveling around the world, living in a different country each month, which was really fun as well. Before COVID, when that was possible. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, uh, after that, uh, I ended up partnering up with one of my classmates from the CDM. We worked on a couple projects together in the CDM and uh, we really enjoyed working together. So uh, Guilherme ended up joining me. He worked on the port of what the box to the Xbox One, which was also very successful and still selling well to this day. And we made a virtual reality project, which was Space Catch with Lasers, which was not very well, <laughs> didn't sell very well, which kind of makes sense because VR is a tougher market, it's a very way smaller market. But it was a fun project. We had fun uh, working on it. We still enjoy it. It was worth doing. Well, you also, it was pretty early, early days because I remember you also had yeah. this demoed at the CVR uh, Expo, right? That was... Uh... Yeah, it was, it was very early days of VR, which VR is still kind of in early days. It's, not, it's always in early days. Like the, the adoption hasn't become mass adoption yet. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That was a fun project. And then, I ended up getting a call from Nintendo at certain points and they asked if I didn't want to bring Rocket Fist to the Switch, which was really early in the Switch release uh, time, which was great for me. Uh, I made a really quick port, was a, a breeze to go through this port, and it ended up finally becoming a commercial success. Rocket Fist, a game that I really love and that kind of started me in the commercial path, also became a commercial success. Which is awesome. I, again, that's the long tail, because sort of, you were saying it was like, you know, it started as a, that passion project and you were yep. going to build it no matter what. And then, you know, it, on the PC side, it uh, wasn't as much of a success, but the Nintendo. Now, how did they discover it? Like, I was, did, did you end up making a reaching out or was that just uh, a call from, you know, a Steam? The first movie? time they, the first time they saw Rocket Fist was in the... Seattle NG Expo, I think, six. Um, okay. I took the game to this one on the top right. I think it was Power, it was some uh, Expo in Seattle. I took the train down from Vancouver and I was showcasing the game there. And, uh, huh? I was just no, it was a PAX, it was a, was a tiny, it was a tiny Expo. Right. I, I didn't, <laughs> I couldn't go to PAX at the time. I was too small for PAX. Yeah. But yeah, uh, Kirk from Nintendo, he played the game there and he was like, I want this game on the, on the Wii because like, it was before the Switch. Right. Before it was Switch. like, that sounds great. So I was like, yeah, he gave me his card and he's like, I want this on the Wii. Let's, let's talk. Let's get this working. But the Wii was a different beast. The Wii was way harder to work with as a developer than the Switch. And I got to develop dev kits, but I had a lot of trouble with the Wii and ended up not working out. But one day, they already knew about Rocket Fist because of the Wii. They called me and was like, hey, did you, you've heard about the Switch? I was like, yeah, I've heard about the Switch. Do you, you guys want to bring this to the Switch? I was like, yes. Yes, please. <laughs> and the, the rest is history. <laughs> that is awesome. So it's very important to showcase your game at Expos because you never know who you're going to run into. Uh, Christina is my partner. Uh, we... We ended up starting to work together uh, a little bit after we got together. She does game design and level design in our games and a little bit of art as well. And we embarked in a journey as uh, digital nomads, working wherever we could. As I was saying, like when you work for yourself, it doesn't matter where you are. We got these beefy Alienware laptops, which we could work with. And we just went on a journey around the world. Uh, I thought there was another slide there. This one, yeah. Yeah, Portugal, Bulgaria, Spain, Hungary. Uh, we were spending one month in each country and it was a lot of fun. And that's where we started uh, Garden Balls, mm -hmm. which was my next big project. Were you saying something? Yeah, I was going to say, so again, pre-COVID, right? When you can travel yeah. and actually spend- Pre-COVID. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 
but again, inspiring, like as an entrepreneur, being able to take that work and do the work from, from wherever. Um, but yeah, leading towards gar garden pause, because I was going to say, like, I, you talked about that one month model of building a game. I, I saw mm -hmm. garden pause and it, it looks like it's got a lot more polish than one month, but I'm, uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here, but yep. um, what's the momentum of building sort of a, a player slash customer based? Are you able to bring that with you with the future um, developments? Can you reach that same audience or is that? Uh, so yeah. now, now that we have the audience from Garden Paws, I believe we can, but at the time mm -hmm. we couldn't. Okay. The Wonder Box audience was very scattered. I, I didn't have like an actual audience for it. People came in, people played, people left, and right. that was it. But the Garden Paws is a different beast. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah, go ahead. I'll be back to you. I was just, I wanted to add a little no bit problem. here because I was curious, but it's because, uh, you know, you talked about, you did the long development on mm -hmm. Rock Fisk, didn't have the initial s success, but legacy asset, in, you know, made it to the switch, became the success, right? Yeah. What the box, boom, one month dev time, fairly quick success, but also, you know, it's, it's got a long tail there. And then Garden Paws. Go ahead. Back to you. I'm curious. So Garden Paws was a game that uh, I, I wasn't as passionate about it. Uh, it's not exactly my style of game, but it's a game that uh, my girlfriend was very passionate about. And it's, she loves this kind of games, uh, the Animal Crossing style, Harvest Moon. And she was like, hey, we should make a game like this. I'm like, ah, I don't know about this. But she was like, no, no, we should. Like, it will sell well. Like, there's nothing like that in the market. It's like something we could play together for making the multiplayer as well. And we like playing games together. So I was like, okay, I'm going to give it a shot. She, she, she pitched it to me. It's like, okay, just, let's just make a game where you can run around and like flowers. I was like, okay, that, that sounds easy. I can, I can do that. So I made a game where you ran around and collected flowers. And I was like, okay, that's, that's actually kind of cool. I like going around and collecting flowers. It's a pretty environment. I'm collecting my flowers. It's like, what can I do with these flowers? Like, maybe you can sell these flowers. So I was like, okay, I put a, I, I made a little cash register, the customers come, the customers buy the flowers. I was like, okay, I have money now. What do I do with this money? Well, maybe you could have quests and you can do upgrades. Like, oh, so we kind of like went building upon the idea, like slowly. <laughs> she said, it was like, I did it like that way so I wouldn't overwhelm you with too many features, <laughs> which worked out well for her. <laughs> and before we knew it, we had a really fun demo that we could like uh, show people with like all the features that we needed. And we decided to raise a Kickstarter with it. And from the beginning of the idea to the Kickstarter was two months. So it was a little bit bigger than the one month idea, but it was still a very short time frame. And if the Kickstarter went well, we kept working on it. If it didn't, we would move on. But thankfully it did well. It resonated a lot with the, the public. And we ended up uh, raising $57,000 in the Kickstarter, which gave us a lot of time to work on the game and like not really have to worry about uh, money at the time. Uh, we ended up like doing a very short cycle. Uh, we started working on that in June and we released as an early access version to the, to the backers in October because we already had like a demo that we released with the Kickstarter, which we told people the demo was about two hours of gameplay, but a lot of people were saying like, I've played eight hours of this demo and I'm still playing because there was no time limit. There's just like this many quests, but you could keep collecting flowers, selling flowers, building, because there's also a building mechanic. I'm actually gonna show you guys in the trailer, the release trailer of the game, so you guys can understand more about what the game is. Yeah, I don't think we have the audio enabled for the video playthrough, but what we could do maybe if you have the links ready um, later on, we could post them in the chat when we get to the Q&A section or so people could play with the, because I know you've got some good audio uh, design elements yeah. in there too. Yeah, we've got a lot of uh, props for the audio. Like my audio designer is always happy because people are saying, this audio is so calming. This audio reduces my anxiety. So we're like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so it was, it's, very, it's interesting, Christina, she, had, she pitched you on the idea, had to get you on board, and you still brought in the MMO elements or quest and, you know, leveling yeah. up and... <laughs> yeah, it's and definitely then, a game that I wouldn't... I, I always made games by myself before, but this game I couldn't have made without her. Like, it's, it's more of, like, her kind of game. Like, I, I wouldn't have made Garden Balls by myself. Yeah, and again, this um, this is another interesting point. So you're a very small team, right? So and you utilize yeah. so 
again, you're used to the interdisciplinary model of working with different skills around you. You, you, you do have a bit of a re renaissance skill set yourself, but you still, you have, Christine, you've worked with audio support. You've worked with- Yeah, Chicago does my audio. <laughs> right, so it's, um, you're still pulling in those additional resources as needed. But again, a lean company allows you to, I guess, have a longer runway, right? Or it's just easier exactly. to keep things flowing, especially with, with your partner. You guys are like, it's a, <laughs> like a core team, right? So. Yeah, we don't have to worry much about like, a, if a game doesn't sell well, we, we are still covered by the other games for a very long runway, like I said. Yeah. So we don't have to worry much about uh, the day-to-day Money yeah. situation. I'm going to the, the long tail of success here too. So mm -hmm. I, I noticed that you're also looking at Switch as the release on Garden Paws. Like, yeah, so I'm guessing sort of a Nintendo connection or previous to get success potentially leads to mm -hmm. future success, right? Or you have connections at least you can leverage. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that's because I looked at that. I, I saw the trailer too, and I was that's not your typical one month dev cycle there to, to put that level of uh, detail in. <laughs> Yeah, Garden Pause is like a very big and a very ambitious project, which is definitely goes different than the on the box idea, but the one month cycle still went to the Kickstarter phase. But mm -hmm. once the game proved itself successful, like it's been about two years now, the Kickstarter is 2018. Three years? We're getting to three years soon. Yeah. Last and year doesn't count, so don't worry about it. This is a... <laughs> <laughs> the game is still selling really well, like Every month it sells half of what, what, what I thought what the box sold really well and that was great. So I, I really can't complain and I, there's no reason to stop working on it. Like it's still producing results. And we're hoping that with the Switch, uh, Switch release, it will bring even more results. The Switch part is being a very difficult part for me because it is such a big game that needs a lot of optimization to run on the Switch. But we're getting there, and we're hoping to be able to release it uh, within the next like three months or so. Yeah. Very cool. What else was I talking about? Oh yeah, uh, I was going to go over a couple of things from the CDM that I I feel that I brought into my making my own indie game company, and one of the big things is scope, which uh, Garden Pulse has a huge scope, but it started with a very small scope, and. Uh, when I was first starting with my huge idea, like I was just learning programming by myself and I wanted to make this game with four playable characters, each with different skills, a leveling system, four different worlds, because it was like four elements. So like each world moves to all these assets. And I was like, I can't, I can't make this, this is too much. So like scope, you gotta find something that you can do really quickly, like a mechanic, a character, just one kind of enemy. And whatever time you think it's gonna take, it's gonna take at least three times longer than you think it's gonna take. It never is like, oh yeah, it's gonna take a week. Like, no, 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 <laughs> it's not the case. Uh, you gotta get to playable state quickly and play test a lot and polish a lot once you're sure of it. It's very yeah, important because like- I'm from Portuguese, thank you. I actually, I, I, I know it, I'm following along the Trey Yeah, Yeah, now, now you got some Portuguese in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. nice. <laughs> Uh, you gotta do more with less. That's that's very important because you gotta uh, validate the idea. Like with the Sony project, for instance, we had seven prototypes. We were all gray box, and we were able to play test those, take it to the clients, and actually get uh, valuable information instead of spending a lot of time in one project just to find out that it's not as fun as you thought. Actually, I'll go on back to that Sony project. I remember. I think your team presented the most ideas. I think you had like a board of thirty. And then you vetted yeah. it down to seven and then you kind of got to. Yeah, we had like 30 ideas that we went down to seven prototypes. Yeah, it was, right. was a lot of prototypes. It was but... a very ambitious team. And um, it was, was it the designer or one of the designers um, from Shadows of the Colossus you'd worked with, right? Was it? Yeah, the... it was. Yeah. It was a really fun project. Yeah. But yeah, we were very ambitious, but I was coming from all those game jams. So I knew that I could make lots of prototypes quickly. And yeah, we, we pulled off a lot of prototypes very quickly. <laughs> I remember there was, uh, when we were pitching our term free project, I think, uh, one of the teachers was like, you can't make a 3D game in one month. Like, you, you, your team just cannot do that. That's not possible. He was right because of the game that we're pitching, but I've made a 3D game in one month. 
<laughs> yeah, practically you did forget what the box it still stands. So yeah. 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 Uh, and on the on the theme of doing more with less, like a lot of my game jams, I try to only do one rig and reuse the same mesh with the same UVs to save in animation time, save in texture time, save in everything. Uh, whenever I'm making assets for game jam game to do it quicker, I try to reuse the assets as much as possible. So you can see here, like uh, with one asset, I can use the formers in Maya at the time, now it's Blender to make this asset look very different and end up like variety of assets. Uh, like this was one blood cell I did for uh, infection and from the blood cell I made like a little geyser thing and from that I made like tower bodies, tower heads, guns, like with one asset, with one texture pretty much, like just doing some small modifications. Uh, planning is something that I definitely took from the CDM. I, was, I wasn't nearly as organized with my projects before. And I started like tracking my time, knowing what I was spending time in, and so to, to see if I was managing my time properly, uh, doing lots of to-do lists and uh, keeping everything organized, doing a Kanban board, parking lot in progress done. Like this was very helpful to me, especially when I was working on my spare time, because uh, I had the system where I put like a uh, importance on the top, like from least important to most important and amount of time estimated that it would take so i would arrive late at home like oh, i'm really tired but i just want to do a quick task i could look in the board what's most important that's the quickest to do and i'll take that so like oh no i have more time what's like a long task that's like eh, not so important but fun because i want something more fun so that gave me a really easy way of seeing which tasks i should do next and the iterative cycle which is so important to me like whenever i'm making a game be it a game jam game or a commercial game which is like a brainstorm your prototype you play test play testing is so important to see if the idea actually works and from there you implement like the full implementation of the the code because sometimes you just write like quick code just to get a play test stage or if it didn't work out you iterate you prototype again you play test and you keep doing that Gray boxing, which is very important. All my game gem games, they always start with like little cubes or capsules. And you can see like uh, on the left is like the gray box. On the right is the final version. Uh, my initial project too, when I was first learning, I was also starting with gray boxing. And what well, the box, which the gray box was still a box, but it became a colorful box later. <laughs> And Rocket Fist, like gray boxing lasted a long time. I did not know it was robots. I did not know what were like Rocket Fists. They were just like little balls with little cubes they threw at each other. One of the play tests I did, I was taking the game to Fulingi and like all of these uh, events that used to happen in Vancouver before the pandemic. <laughs> and one of the people playing, I'm like, oh, I really like how these little robot guys, like they throw their fists at each other. I was like, yeah. That's totally what we're doing. Ah, yeah, that's, what that's I how that happened. I was, I was wondering about that. But also, <laughs> that's a project room at the CDM, actually. I haven't seen one in a while. That is, like, yeah. That's a project you. room at the CDM. And we're play testing at the CDM. Yeah. And the I mean, that's an interesting thing for this, the, the cohort that's on the call here with us. I mean, obviously, very unique year, right? But everyone's yeah. working remote. So, I mean, many haven't been through the building yet. But I think, you know, one of the things that I want to yeah, give you the breather on here, too, but for everyone on mm -hmm. the call is that, the CDM becomes your home. You're always welcome back. Like it's like, and Daniel, when I had you as a guest speaker in the classroom before, that was yeah. as an alumni. Now you're meeting up via Zoom. You're in Halifax. It would have been hard to, to have done this in person. So in this case, it kind of worked out. But yeah, it's really yeah. cool to see, see a project room again. Anyway, I'm, I'm overly excited about that. You so. can see how dark it is there. It was late. <laughs> yeah, that's, you, yes, you definitely were working. It was, it was really fun being able to just go to the project rooms or any time and work or play or like whatever, like, be be around people with uh that's one thing that's whenever someone think, asks me like oh should i do like not in the case of the cdm but should i do a like a, a course like a 3d modeling or a programming should i do it presential like in the schools like you can learn this stuff by yourself like in the case of 3d modeling and this kind of things but it's something different to be in a building with a lot of like-minded people mm -hmm. that you can just like hey can you show me this like can i show you this like it's, it's a different feeling and it's a different like, learning experience. I felt that I learned a lot from my classmates, both yeah. from the CDM and the other courses I did presentially. 
Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's, that's the unique thing about education though, too, right? Or yeah. from an employer perspective, they say, yeah, you can be self-taught, you can have portfolios mm -hmm. that stand and get you, but what you learn from bouncing ideas off with other people, whether it's in person or even working remotely yeah. now, collaboration and learning from the people around you, that's needed, right? So it's, and you still do yeah, that. For right? sure. and, yeah. Yeah. The CDM is my opinion is a different case too because you're learning collaboration itself, <laughs> not exactly just a skill like a three D modeling or programming. True, it's three D modeling. Collaboration with other people is hard. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, balancing, which to me is a, a big cycle of just play testing and iteration. You try something, change the value, change like how fast the shots go out. You go and play test this with people and you see the result. If it's, is this better? Is this worse? Sometimes it's worse. Sometimes it's better. You keep iterating until you find the perfect balance. And to me, like whenever I'm making a game, I, I made it very easy to ch change values and change things. Like in this case, I'm changing the shooting values to see like, oh, I can make different weapons. Maybe my weapon shoots very slowly and like it goes like a little bombs of death that goes slowly or fast or like how more bullets, you get a shotgun. It's important to have ways of iterating quickly because you never know what's the perfect way of uh, doing things. You've got to test it out. For level design, I always try to make modular blocks. Uh, this is a level editor that I made for Rocket Fist. So I could make levels quicker and iterate quicker that way. Uh, for uh, infection and other of my game jam games I actually made a procedural level generator because it was a game jam I didn't have a lot of time to do levels so like making quick levels was very important and feature creep which is very important to avoid making feature creep uh, getting too many features that don't really add to your game but take a lot of time to make that was a big problem with me with rocket fist I convinced myself that Rocket Fist needed a single player mode. I kept trying different iterations of it and it didn't feel right. Eventually I found a, a iteration that felt right and the single player is actually a lot of fun, but it didn't really need single player. It's, it's a very fun multiplayer game and it could have just been a very fun multiplayer game that I finished way quicker. So yeah. We got, we got to the Q&A. We did, and actually in, in good time in that too. And actually some of the things you're bringing up are super relevant for some of the teams that are in the home stretch for projects right now. Mm -hmm. I know one team's doing a, a game project, um, actually with the Consulate of France, but uh, how about, yeah, stop the screen cool. share. Um, if anyone has questions, you can either come on camera, come at Daniel with that. Uh, you can use the chat, um, kind of open forum now. It looks like, oh, Tom. Where are you, Tom? Okay, that's right. It's text here. What's your favorite country to visit, live in for a month? So yeah, when you were traveling there and working while you're traveling, what was the? I think it would be Indonesia. Like I, I really enjoyed. Uh, I went to Bali, uh, Ubud. I really enjoyed living in Indonesia. It was a very chill place. Like we had a, a good pool and a lot of good food. Like so much good food for cheap. And yeah, it was it was a good place. <laughs> like I Turkey I mean... was also really fun. Like Turkey was a Nice place to be as well. People are so inviting and welcoming in Turkey. Yeah. That's a good cool ski. Yes. How long did you get? Uh, I guess you're looking for a, a stable internet connection, power, desk to work from, or beach to work from. What were your prereqs yeah. for choosing where you were? Uh, going? The internet connection is less important than you'd imagine because a lot of the time you're not really uploading the game, you're just working on the game, which you don't need a very good internet to do, just like a usable internet. Right. Yeah. And a good pool is key. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, so let me see. So it is March the 24th, uh, March, January, February, March, April. So the, the teams that are um, with the projects that we're tackling right now, they're sort of in that home stretch. What would be something that you would do as they're heading towards that final handoff to a client? Even like thinking back to your Sony project, um, or even you were on the mainframe project too, right? Uh, the I was, yeah, that was a fun project. Yeah, I learned a lot because uh, there were some good programmers in that project, and I I wasn't a very good programmer at the time. I was I was a programmer, but I was self-taught, and I I got to learn a lot from them, like watching what we're doing, like reading for code. And that's something that I would suggest, like people that are working on a try to to get new skills, like enjoy the 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 proximity to these classmates that know more than you and 
just try to learn something else. If you're an artist, try to learn a little bit of programming. If you're a programmer, try to learn a little bit of art. That's true. I've been hearing that from employers too. Like even to say, it's not to say become, if you're an artist, become a programmer, but knowing yeah. how to get the assets working properly or more seamless, you know, integrating well with the programmer, like that, that knowledge is definitely. Sure. Oh, it looks like Dave's jumping in here. He's probably still eating out of his bowl. So that's why he's not on camera, but uh, he's throwing, oh, there we go. Yeah, there's the spoon in mouth. Uh, any other specific failures along the way that helped you become successful? Okay, so yeah, pro tips, yeah. lessons learned. Rocket Fist as a failure definitely taught me that I shouldn't uh, shouldn't spend as much time without proving the success of the project. Uh, Space Cats with lasers, I feel that uh, after all the box, we're trying to capitalize on the idea of a viral sensation game, like, oh, it's funny, Space Cats, and like, he's riding a, a cheese and thing. But the game itself wasn't as fun to play. In the playtesting stages, like, I don't think even we enjoyed playing it as mm. much as, as uh, Waterbox or Rocket Fist. And that should have been a sign for us that we should probably not invest as much time in this game. But we, we didn't think as much about that. So I think uh, that failure also taught us about this. If, if it's a game that people want to keep playtesting, there's probably something there. If not, you might want to move on. That's, that's a, it's really good advice because, I mean, we often hear about that in the startup world on validating your idea in the yeah. customer, right? And often it's very isolated to just work on my thing and release mm -hmm. it when it's ready. And if, but if, that, if the hook isn't there, if it's yeah. not fun, if, you know, if you're not even having fun at that point. Exactly. Like with yeah. the Garden Pause demo, for instance, like we said, like we prepared two hours of quests. Some people are playing for eight hours. That's, right. There's something there. Like people keep playing this game. Yeah, and actually, I do remember that even from the Sony project that Asano or like was saying it was like get the mechanic down. Everything else is gravy or something. Or yeah, that it was, exactly. You know, the, the fun thing, like the thing that's going to work or that gets you engaged. What's around it? I think yeah, I used a soup metaphor or something. I'm remembering it was like <laughs> years ago, but uh, I, I remember. Yeah, it was, something like that. <laughs> so it nice. was. It's like a recipe. Like if you get that core, you know, it's, everything else yeah. is you know is the extra. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was that was cool. Um, so we also have, what has been the toughest part about starting up your own company? It's from Tom. Toughest part about starting up your own company? Counting, Honestly, finance, incorporating, banking, uh, legal. Uh, I mean, I, you, you go ahead. Everything at. wasn't really hard because like, I imagine it would be harder if the company didn't have a lot of money in the beginning. But since what the box was selling well, we didn't really have to worry about much of this stuff, which is like, Oh, we need a, a, to incorporate, hire a lawyer, here's money. Uh, we need a, an accountant. Oh, it's just like, we, we got our problems kind of taken care of for, for us because we had like a, accountants and lawyers to deal with this kind of stuff. So I was only focused on making the game and working on the game. I wasn't really worried about the company part of things because only once a year I sit down with like a, my, my bookkeeping on QuickBooks and I go, categorizing all my expenses and I hate doing that, but I just did it like last week. It's so annoying, but yeah, it's, I guess I would say that's the, the most annoying part, which is categorizing my expenses for the year. Yay taxes. Oh, Dave's got a, did you outsource marketing or relied on the viral? So I, I have an interesting relationship with marketing. Like, as I said in the beginning of the presentation, I have a, a bachelor's in advertisement, but I, not like advertisement. And with Rocket Fist, I was trying to do all the, the, the things that people say, like, oh, email all the influencers, like write the press release, like do this, do that. I did all of those things and it didn't result in sales. So I was like, I'm not gonna do it. Before the box, I just put the game out there and it started selling and all the influencers were playing. And I was like, I, I, I did everything and they didn't do it. So now I didn't do any of the things and they did. So I was like, I'm not gonna do this anymore. And I, I, I still don't, like, I do not do any advertisement on marketing. Like the games kind of advertise themselves. I don't, I don't know if they just, they just do. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I kind of counter your point though, but because you gave yourself a lot of exposure by participating in those expos, jams, you know, putting your, even streaming your dev. That was Rocket Fist. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Yeah, it's, it's, you. Was it only Rocket Fist you did that with? Everything else is Yeah, I did not bring Waterbox to a single ex expo. Like, Waterbox was not in the expos or anything. I did do the streaming with Waterbox. I was live streaming at the time. That was something. 
Didn't you have some streaming with um, uh, Garden Paws too? Or I, saw, I thought I saw a dip. We do, yeah. We stream, okay. we stream nowadays with Garden Paws as well. Like we have a really active Discord with Garden Paws, which is great. Garden Paws has a very nice community around it. It is a very calming, relaxing game. So the community is very supportive and loving and like, it's a mm -hmm. great community. I love our community. We have Would about you... 7,000 people, I think, in our Discord. Yeah, and you were saying, I mean, on that community and customer base, like I was going back to like in yeah. hindsight, you know, if you, you know, even though the, what the boss was saying that those sales are very, you know, sporadic and located everywhere, mm -hmm. like, is there value in trying to have that con player base connection for future sales? Like if you could connect up with the earlier sales history, like I guess you're working on building that more into the garden pause or the community you're building yeah. around that product. I think so. I think uh, our community really likes this kind of games. And if we make more games in the genre, which we probably will make, our community is there. Like, they keep playing Garden Paws. They keep, like, giving suggestions. They, yeah. they really love the game. And we're so thankful for, for them being there, which is great. So well, I think we'll be able big, to bring that forward. You made a very you know, smart point, too, about reusing assets, whether it's rigs or, or some mm -hmm. of the... You know, but, because I, I think you you um, you release sort of a seasonal add-on to what the box or something like you can do an update very quickly and kind of make it yeah. like ice version or the you know fire version or like you can yeah. always iterate on something or garden paws. I mean you're kind of built in with uh, but yeah you've got some you know I, I, I saw I think it was Disney reusing sort of some of the animation cells like in, in leaner days and it was I saw that too. I was like business. yeah you, you made me think of that. It's smart business. I mean hey if Disney's doing it. Daniel should we actually made a, a spin-off game called Potion Paws, which is kind of like a Garden Paws Halloween version. I didn't right. put it in the presentation, but uh, we yeah. also kickstarted that and we got, uh, got some good money on that. Yeah. Where are you at with like in-app purchasing or um, customizations, costumes, hats, clothing? Uh, we, don't, we don't do that. Uh, yeah. We do plan on exploring that, but uh, we're still working on the Switch part. And, uh, mm. We feel that we should, we owe it to our community to release the Switch part yeah. before, like actually completing Garden Paws before releasing DLC. Because yeah. we feel Garden Paws is not complete yet with all the Switch part. I like that customer loyalty here. I'm going to leave with one or two last questions because we will do mm -hmm. a hard stop at seven. I know students have a, yep. a DMC meeting coming up, but yeah, Dave's going, are you a unicorn? I believe you are. I think you've answered that. You've actually, you know, I don't know if the <laughs> horn's not there, but you know, you do have a unicorn element. Yeah, the only um, thing I cannot do is audio. Audio yes. I cannot do. Yeah, what? but you do benefit from the skills around you. Again, you have a, yeah. you've got a great partner in crime who pitched you on Garden Paws and exactly. probably glad she did. So, uh, you know, it's unicorns need friends too. Um, Tom is asking, so when you plan to make a game, do you think about having existing audience first or do you think about the game story first? Are you thinking of the end audience? Or are you thinking about the game? Uh, I personally think about uh, the mechanics first. Like with Rocket Fist, they were just balls throwing cubes at each other. With other box, we were just like cubes shooting at each other. Uh, Story ends up coming later for me. Like Rocket Fist ended up having a story. I, this guy that was playtesting kind of like gave me the idea and like I ran with it. And Mother Box, uh, my partner actually gave me an idea and I ran with it. But I usually think in mechanics first and I want to get a game that's fun to play first before thinking about the story. Right. And I guess so within, so where did Christina's idea of so the garden pause the more casual collecting, like, did she pitch you on the story then? Because I'm like, you're saying you come at it from with the, the, the game mechanic, but you know, what, what, how did she sell you the, on the way, The way she pitched it to me was more mechanic wise because she knew how to pitch to me. She knows how I am. She, she, she only let me know the parts of the idea that would get me more excited about it. She reeled you in. That's the. Yeah, uh, she reeled me in. Yeah, yeah, she did. She did. Until the, right. until the idea. <laughs> yeah, well, that is awesome. Well, you know what? I think what I'm going to do is I, I am going to end it here because, hey, it, it's 11 p.m. for you. There's Dave popping on, on camera mm -hmm. here, too. So, um, but yeah, this is a, amazing. I, like, your your talk was it's super appreciated. Everything you've shared, Thank you. of course. Um, can't wait until one day we get to see each other in person again, whether it's at the CDM or if I make it out to the East Coast, I'll be yeah. in by. But uh, amazing. You know, it's, um, your time is super appreciated. Your advice, of course and wishing you nothing but ongoing success. And, you know, in the future, hopefully you need interns and you can connect with Dave. <laughs> Dave's got the hookups with interns. Yeah, who knows? 
So it's like, yeah. It's Obsidian easier. people over coming to Halifax. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also we talk one day in the future, a project we'll talk to, but uh, yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, oh yeah, you can start up your own studio group, get Halifax, move everyone out there. It's like, who knows? It's uh, a <laughs> the beautiful part of the country. It's anyway. a great place. <laughs> exactly. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, nothing but thanks for you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll let you have a, enjoy your sleep, I guess. I was going to say the rest of your evening, but it's getting late. You should go to bed. It's, a, you know, <laughs> Dave, I hope you enjoy <laughs> that's your true, That's true. <laughs> thanks, Daniel. Great to see you all the time. Thank you. you. Yeah, there's Josh coming in. Josh, thanks for recording. And everyone else, thanks for coming out tonight. So, Daniel, everyone, I'm going to hit the end button, which ends it for us all. It hurts me every time, but uh, it was great seeing people, even through this screen. Um, this is a, a, the best part of my week. So thank yes. you. All Bye. Right. Bye. <laughs> Bye.